Welcome to Atlanta Live. Wow, we have a great show for you tonight, honey. I'm excited. We're talking about mental health all month long. Listen, if you got someone that's dealing with mental health in your home or you have dealt with mental health issues, depression, anger, psychosis, I mean, it's a lot that we deal with that in some homes is a taboo. Yes. You don't talk about it outside the house. You kind of deal with it internally. Well, tonight, we want you to put God back in control of your mental yes. health. There's a lot of people that suffer from mental health and they don't get help because they don't know where to get help. But tonight we have Lorraine Tremell. She's going to be talking about her resources that she had to find for her son, her family member. You know, honey, we've been blessed uh, not to deal with that with our children, but we've been in the ministry. We've seen a lot of people with mental yes. health issues. What's the one thing you would say to someone who may be suffering with mental health tonight? Pray first and do your research. Amen. Because if you research and you get the help you need through prayer, yes. because God will lead you, he will guide you, he will speak to you in that still, small voice. So don't go anywhere tonight. We have a lot to talk about. If you have a prayer request, call that number, 770-300-9828. Our prayer partners are willing to, they want to pray with us, right? That's what prayer partners do. They pray with you. So please call that number, 770-300-9828. Our prayer partners want to touch and agree with you. The Bible says where two or three is touch and agree, God is in the midst. Amen. So join us tonight as we talk about mental health. Now, we're going to go to the music tonight with Malachi Mills singing Messiah.
Malachi Hill, he's going to be with us all night long. This young man got talent. He loves the Lord, and he's safe for the glory of God. But, honey, tonight we have on the set, this mother has fought a good fight for her son. Now, Miss Lorraine Tremell. Yes. How you doing, girl? I'm blessed. Welcome to Atlanta Live. Thank now, you. Now, this is Mental Health Month, and you've had a journey. Uh, you've raised beautiful children. Yes. But you had one specific child mm -hmm. that had it not been for the Lord, mm. that child would be six feet under. That's just mm. putting it bluntly. Yes, yes. That's putting it bluntly. That's true, though. Because a lot of people with <laughs> mental health issues don't get help until it's too late. Mm -hmm. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that, once they're dead, they're dead. But mm -hmm. you didn't want your son to die prematurely, so you fought. Mm. Let's start here. What was the diagnosis? Let's start there. And I'm still fighting. So I Amen. wanted to make, say that first because it's still a principality. So oh, yeah. uh, what started it was him, him. What was your question again? What was the diagnosis that triggered you having to fight this fight for your child? Well, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. However, before I found out about schizophrenia, he would, his behavioral uh, was act, he was acting out differently. And because I had a relationship with my son and my other children, I knew something was wrong. He was a smart A student all through school, all through elementary, middle school, as well as high school. And because his behavioral um, disorders was out of order and not normal, I began to recognize something's wrong. And a mother knows when something is wrong. If you're in tune and have a relationship with your children like you have a relationship with God, you know when something's wrong. That's right. So it's when your child left the home, went to college, he had an episode. He was still home with me, and I was, okay. he was in uh, college up at Georgia Gwinnett College. Okay. But these episodes was occurring during that time with me picking him up and going home. His behavior was just way different uh, than the average child and from the way he would normally act. He wasn't responding to me the way that he should. If I call him by his name or whatever or tell him to do something, he would stand there and stare at the refrigerator and, and, and I'm right here telling him to get so it. So he went from an A student mm -hmm. to a, a child that's disillusioned, Yes, exactly. Talking to himself. Disoriented, having, yes, having yes. psychosis. Yes, right. that's exactly. So out of all of that, God began to speak to you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And God began to help you understand some things. Cause you're a Christian woman. Yes. Grew up in the church, loved the Lord, grew your family in the Lord. But you yourself had to go through some trials and tribulations. We'll call it trials and tribulations. That's exactly what they were. <laughs> And dealing with principalities in yes, high places. Exactly. Uh -huh. That's exactly. Yes. Yes. In a yes. But I wanted to build this thing into something. Mm -hmm. You went to a traumatic divorce. Mm -hmm. Just to put your business out there. Mm, that's okay because you I wrote a book on that too. You went yeah. to a traumatic divorce, <laughs> mm -hmm. which caused a separation in yes. the home. Yes. Which put you into a depression. Because I want our audience to realize, you real people here. Yes. You're not here just to look cute and mm -mm. talk about a book. Mm -mm. No. This was birth mm -hmm. out of pain, anguish, calling on the name of the Lord, because you were dealing with powers and principalities that was beyond your In control. In high places, yes. Amen. Yes, yes, So, indeed. But I want to build a little foundation for our audience to see that Lorraine is not some deranged mom or some, uh, the, the candy lady in mm -hmm, the neighborhood. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're a mother that saw your child go through a serious mental decline. Yes, yes. For whatever reasons, this happened to your child. Yes. And, and there was no help available that you saw on the surface. 
That's so right. what led you to, to getting the help you needed? Where, where you started at? Well, because I'm of the type of parent that I am and I was raised to uh, what goes on in the house stays in the house. And that's the taboo right there. Mm -hmm. That's the taboo. Don't yes. talk about it outside well, the house. Right, Keep it right. clean up. Exactly. And so because I was raising my children in a conservative lifestyle in my home and what goes on in the house, stay in the house, it was really hurting me. It was hurting everything because of the divorce that I was going through. And, I, and, I, and it did put a dark cloud over my head. And that was the enemy's job. I went That's into a wanted. state of depression. Right. And because you, I was raised in a church, I knew to call on God, but it, it seemed like God wasn't coming and healing me fast enough. So I began to just get into that state of depression, and I began to write everything down because I didn't trust anyone. As I would begin to write everything down of what I was dealing with and going through, even in the midst of the separation uh, while I was married, because I was married uh, nearly 30 years. And so that, that took a toll on me. That, that was some heavy artillery for me to handle. And then raised three children of my own. My son, my 28-year-old son, was a straight-A student all through elementary, uh, middle school, high school. And I began to see different behavior problems within him. And because I'm a parent that's in tune with my children and know what they do, and I, you have to have a relationship with your children. Uh, you have to know what they're doing and, and talk with them. You can't allow jobs and uh, to take you off a of mindset. So I knew something was wrong. You have to be able to not be in denial and recognize it. At one point I was in denial because he was so smart. I couldn't believe that it was right. actually occurring. I couldn't believe these things were happening. And so uh, that's what ha uh, allowed me to be able to start writing the books because I recognized different behavior problems. Even in the midst of what I was dealing with and what I was going through, the children still needed a parent to, to guide them. Okay, well let, let's Let's kind of catch up a little bit. You went through this traumatic 30-year marriage. Now you're divorced. Mm -hmm. You're having to readjust your lifestyle. Mm -hmm. You're a single parent with three kids now. Mm -hmm. But you got this taboo. Don't talk about it. Right. We'll deal with it internally. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching us tonight and you're trying to deal with this stuff internally, Lorraine is telling you it don't work. You mm -hmm. need help. But, but you did have a hope because you were journaling. Yes. A lot of yes. people don't journal their stuff. That was your outlet was journaling your thoughts. That was my meditation. Right down, that was your meditation time mm -hmm. where you, you sought the Lord, but as you dealt with these emotions, you wrote them down. Mm -hmm. But let's back up here. Also, the enemy has been sitting back, plotting and planning for this whole event whole, yes, to take yes. place. That's why it's so important to study to show yourself approved. Amen. So when these things occur in your life and you see them coming in, you may not recognize it, but God wants us to be able to recognize things right. that are happening in our lives. But because the depression was over my head in the dark mm -hmm. cloud, I really couldn't see. That's the scales right. were trying to cover up my eyes. That's why uh, it, it, I started writing things down because I didn't trust anybody. And with me writing everything down, what was happening, again, that was my meditation and my medication right. because I felt like I was going crazy at one point. And if you tell somebody this, they're going to think something's wrong with your entire family. I get that, but what mm -hmm. made Lorraine say, I need help? I never got help. It was God that delivered me. Because in my day, I'm, I'm, I'm 55. I put it out there. I'm, I'm 56, 55. honey. So in I my day, in, in, in my day, you don't see, seek help. You don't seek therapy. You don't because that's that. that's crazy. That's so so right right. So I was in the midst of that. So I refused to get help because you don't go and they on anyone's couch. So because I am the Christian woman that I am, I just kept pressing my way through and going to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday, and I was being ministered to. It seemed like every time my pastor was preaching. He was talking to me and didn't know what I was going through in my household. And I knew that that was the Holy Spirit, for Amen. one. So that was my healing. And I, the way that I found out something was really wrong with me is when I really wrote the second book, which is that one. And uh, uh, the, the person that I was actually speaking with, she said, well, you know, depression is a, a mental health state of mindset, too. I said, well, I, ain't never, I, ain't, I ain't mentally just out there. I'm not a mental health patient. I was depressed, but I'm not mentally, you know. And she said, no, it falls, it that. falls right. in that because category. It was a stigma, yeah. was a stigma mm -hmm. added to it. Yeah. So here you are with your children now mm -hmm. starting to fall into these uh, mental challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you still had to find some help for them. Well, see, I... I didn't, we, we, we getting ahead because again, I didn't know that depression was a mental state of depression, uh, of, of, of illness. I didn't know that at one point. So when 
my son was taking me through all these different changes and I saw that he was acting differently, that's when I said I need to get him some help. So when I sought help for him as a parent, that's when my eyes were opened that he has a MHD, a mental health disorder, and they titled it schizophrenia. And so, so then they gave you a list of what schizophrenia is caused for. Right. On that list, it said depression. Mm -hmm. And you know, um, we was talking back here in the back. Mm -hmm. You said, um, as a Christian, you know what we call mm -hmm. mental health and schizophrenic and stuff that the enemy likes to put on us, mm -hmm. but then the world puts... They stigmatize they it. Well, they, they give it a diagnosis. Yes. Yes. We know it's powers and principalities and demons at work. That's mm -hmm. right. But mm -hmm. again, we talking about the natural here. Mm -hmm. And in the natural, there is mental illness mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the flesh is weak. Mm -hmm. And the flesh has to struggle uh, when it's not properly aligned and it's not balanced. Mm -hmm. That was it. What the issue was, it was an imbalance yes. with your son. Yes, and if you've never been through it, you wouldn't know that. The doctors titled that schizophrenia, yes. which means it's a chemical imbalance right. on the yes. inside of him because as a child he was diagnosed with ADHD. However, right. when I the ADHD, he didn't act out like that. So he went off to college and began to drink or smoke or whatever. When you open the door, and smoking, mm -hmm. you open in the door to allow those forces in your exactly. life. So the Holy Spirit just showed me that someone did something to whatever it is he was smoking or drinking yes. because it triggered the chemical imbalance. And he, yes. had, he hasn't been the same since. So with that being said, with him receiving the help that he received to, for, from the diagnosis and they diagnosed him, they also give you drug tests so but with that being said all of that is in there together when they get these tests and they give them those diagnoses that is how we came to the mental health d disorder right, well let's, let's, let's kind of move a little further he has he's now getting some help mm -hmm. but yes. you realize very quickly some of the help that you were getting was was hurting Yes, but yes, that, I did that, share that I'm with you in the back. I'm not trying to put yeah. nobody on blast, but no, I no, want no, people no. to realize you got to do your homework. Mm -hmm. And pray Because Lorraine, you said something very clear that touched me. Mm -hmm. You said you had to get involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of times, folks, we just trust the doctor's opinion. A lot of times, we just trust mm -hmm. what we hear yes. uh, from these psychologists. But that, again, it's a, it's a diagnosis. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's something that they're trying to determine. Right. But you knew your child. Yes. You knew God. Right. And you knew God was going to help you find the right resources. Exactly. That's who you depend on. And I stumbled across all of that. And I don't want you to feel like you're, you're putting me on blast for anything because the purpose of a Christian and, and, a, and a used vessel to be used by Christ, you have to ask, ask those questions the way in order to get it out to the people so that they can have a full understanding right. and really see Ooh. how God operates and how God will show you things and how you can press forward to your way of getting help for your loved one, which is what happened with me. So my son was actually uh, the program that I actually signed him up with. Uh, they suggested that he go to rehab. And I thought, okay, since this is a program and they're getting him help, I really thought that they was gonna get him help. That's what a parent think. I don't know anything about that. I'm just trying and to get you're already him. like trusting I'm trying to get yeah. him some H-E-L-P and I trust mm -hmm. the system because the system had access to getting him professional help. I'm a parent, I can see certain things, but I'm not the professional in that arena. They may see something in it that I don't. So with that being said, when I got him the help uh, and the place that he was in, they switched his medication without telling me. And because mm -hmm. I found out about them switching the medication is because I stayed in tune with my son. You have to have a close relationship and stay in tune with them. When you when you get them some help and put them in these facilities, don't just leave your loved ones there. You have to know you the people to, treating your you child. You have to get to treat, know the people treating your child. You, you said something to me. You yes. said I had to get to know I the doctors, to know the them. nurses, the, doctors, the, the, nurses, the, the people everybody. working the floors. Everybody, you the got to know the maintenance man. Man. Along, I got to along with yes. asking God to direct them to <laughs> guide me. But you know, through that yes. process, you saw that mm -hmm. some of these facilities truly wouldn't giving him the help, the help that, that he needed. needed. Mm -hmm. So by getting involved, you had to seek other avenues until you found mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. proper place for him. But that took prayer. Yeah. I heard you say it out loud. Yes. She told us, honey. Yes. He said, I had to pray. Cause yes. You said, God woke you up in the middle of the night a few mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. said, where right. your child is at, yes. he's at risk. Yes. Found him out in the street, mm -hmm. undressed, 
about to be frostbitten, uh -huh. but he was in a facility, mm -hmm. supposedly, mm -hmm. quote, quote, a facility mm -hmm. getting the help, mm -hmm. but yet he's out there half naked, mm -hmm. laying in the, in, the, in, the, in the freezing In the wee hours of the night, and the police report stated that he had frostbite on his head and frostbite on his eyelids, and uh, you, you know if you see someone lying there in the wee hours of the night in the cold, freezing weather, Simple. something's wrong. However, if you're a professional, you're supposed to know that as well. But they did, and the police officers took him, and they just beat him like he was an animal. And but however, I don't want to speak much on it because that's in my story, so yes. I, can, I have to cut that little storyline there. And, and however, mm -hmm. we gotta always lean and depend on God totally. Yes, that's why our help comes. Yes. Talk yes. about these these what we call traumatic experiences. Yes. Mm -hmm. but, yes. but through that process, mm -hmm. you got your son to help, and you're still fighting. You said it. You're yes. still fighting for yes. him. So, yes. So, folks, look. Here's a mother that's telling you, mm. it's okay to go get the help. Don't be like we are in the old right. days, the taboo, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. where we'll keep it in the house, we'll worry about it with the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost gonna work it out. Well, God dangerous. says, use wisdom and knowledge. Yes. You have to take the wisdom and the knowledge of med the medical profession, mm -hmm. the, psych the psychiatrist, the, all the treatment centers. Where's your baby at now? He's with me. And due to COVID, uh, the facility that I actually had him in, they said that I was an endangerment to the facility, which I understood because gotcha. uh, when the COVID first hit, uh, they did, you know, you couldn't, couldn't visit. You couldn't visit. And I was like, there's no way I'm going to leave my son there. What if something happened to me? Right. And I would not want to leave him in a place like that for the rest of his life because I have two more children. It's not their responsibility. Yes, they love their brother, but it's not their responsibility. You They're you learning, won't. right. And the father is not on site to, to help him because he need help as well. So therefore, you got to do something now. So I retired from my job. The Holy Spirit allowed me to be able to retire. I stepped out on supernatural faith, and then Ooh, I got you heard that yeah, supernatural. I got him out of that facility. I, I trust and believe God is going to make a way. How so y'all doing now? Today it's a it's a principality. It's an everyday principality. Yes. However, when you're walking through your principalities. It's better to walk through it with Christ than not to have Christ in your life. Amen. You're about you to preach. Let me do this. I yeah. got two it. minutes left. Yeah. <laughs> I want you to look into that camera, Lorraine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Encourage a parent. Encourage someone that may be needing the help that you had to go look for. Mm -hmm. Let them know how they can, how you can help them. Let me see if I can tell it to them without crying and stand strong in this right here because I'm actually dealing with this right now. Uh, the reason I titled the book Power for Faith While Conquering Principalities is because I am dealing with the principality each and every day because he was diagnosed with the schizophrenia. Yes, he is, but he can be delivered from that. Amen. I'm going to say that that's the title that the doctors gave him, but that's not the title that God gave him. God gave him a mother that sees something better in him. He has new life in him, and we pray a prayer every day. We declare and decree in the name of Jesus that God will deliver him for restoration of his mind, body, and soul, but you have to trust and believe, and you have to really turn it over to Jesus and trust that believe that God will deliver your, your loved one from whatever it is. Not only that, you have to pray with them. So we have a prayer that I wrote down for him every day. He has to read that prayer because you can want them delivered all day long, but if they don't want to be delivered, it's, it's not going to work. So I encourage him to read this prayer. I ask him, do you want God to help you? He say yes. I said, well, let's hit it. Let's read that's this prayer. <laughs> that's, 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 yes. that's, yes. that's the start. That's going to be the beginning yes. of the mm -hmm. salvation mm -hmm. experience. Yes. Listen, mm -hmm. folks, we like to put a bookmark in it right here. Lorraine, you've been such a, a blessing to us. If people yes. need help and they want to reach you, how can they reach you? They can reach me under my IG. It's P-O-W-E-R underscore F-U-L 19. That's powerful. And that's P-O-W-E-R underscore F-U-L. Amen. Listen, nice. we're going to go to a, a, a very good interview where Heather Kleber, uh, Kleber uh, she's going to help interview Nicole Golden, and that's going to be after you hear Hallelujah, the Victor by Malachi Mills. There's so much going on tonight with this mental health thing. It, we got so much to cover, but enjoy the music by Malachi Mills, and we'll come back with this interview with Heather Claymore, yes. okay? God bless you.
can't separate us from your love Holy Spirit, you abide in us And the curse of death cannot come between What can separate us from your love What can separate us from your love
I'm Heather Claver, and I'm here tonight with Nicole Golden, a blogger, Scar Stories podcast, and mental health advocate. Welcome, Nicole. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Great. Um, so let's start this off by telling everybody a little bit about yourself and how you got into what you're doing now. Okay, absolutely. Yes, my name is Nicole Golden. As um, Heather said, I live in Tampa, Florida. And about 10 years ago, um, my husband and I got married May and May of 2010. And then he became lead pastor of a, um, at that time, very small church. Um, and then a couple months later, um, my wheels just fell off of my life, basically. And I had a mental, emotional breakdown. And um, come to find out a couple months after those initial breakdowns, I was diagnosed with anxiety, depression, and borderline personality disorder. And for us, you know, we had both grown up in really strong Christian homes, um, God-fearing homes. But back then, mental health really wasn't something anyone discussed. A lot of times, um, counseling, mental illness, all of those things were just crutches um, for people to get attention, get medication, whatever. And so we had really no context for what was happening to me. We just knew I was suicidal, I was coming unraveled, I was physically hurting myself, I was assaulting my husband physically, and we just needed help. And so when we got the diagnoses, I do remember I was relieved. I think my husband was like, wait, what? You know, like right. he's just been named lead pastor. And he tried to resign from the church, um, but the elders ripped up his resignation and said, no, like you guys are going to have a story. And I'll never forget my counselor looking at Bryant and saying, like, I believe God's going to do something powerful with Centerpoint Church. And if he can't, if the enemy can't get to you, he's going to go through Nicole to get to you. Right. You mentioned that on your website. That's really powerful that you, yeah. that, you know, that's kind of what started you on your path, correct? Yeah, it was eye-opening to me that like, man, if I don't go after healing, I, I don't believe I'm healed. And I'm sure we'll get to that at some point in the, right. in the interview. But if I don't go after my healing um, with everything I've got, there are so many lives hanging in the balance. You know, all of these lives that Jesus wants to impact through our church. And so that kind of lit a fire under my booty. And <laughs> I went hard after healing. And um so mental health was always something I was really passionate about. And I knew God was going to use our voice, but I also knew we needed to take some time to really make sure we were in a healthy place before we started sharing our story. And so about seven or eight years ago, I shared my story for the first time at our church. I preached that Sunday and, and shared my story. And a couple months later, my brother committed suicide. And I think it was that moment where I was like, we need to start getting louder about this. Like right. We need to start doing more. And so... Um, that year was pretty tough, but then last year, 2020, was the year when God was like, let's go, let's do this. And so that's when we started the podcast, the website, the blog, all of that. Okay. So. And you mentioned your husband is a lead pastor at yes. Centerpoint Church. How has this um, journey changed how he is um, a pastor and leading his church and leading others? How has this changed him as, in addition to you? Yeah, you know, it's been awesome. We started Center Point Church as a creating it kind of in the line of, and, and you guys are based out of Atlanta. So when I say right. North Point Community Church, you're all going to be like, we know that church. <laughs> um, we're actually in network with North Point, okay. but we really wanted it to be a church where unchurched people wanted to attend. And so we created a, an alternative to church as usual is what we say. And um, we knew we were going to be dealing with a lot of broken people. Basically, we're kind of the church that people come to as a last resort. Like I've given Jesus all these chances. I've given church all these chances. This is the last chance I've got. And if I don't meet him here, then that's it, you know? Right. And so I think us walking through that season of utter, complete brokenness where we felt so alone, we didn't know what our future was going to look like. We didn't know if I was going to survive. I mean, we were, we'd be driving to counseling you know, appointments, and I'd be trying to throw myself out of the car. I mean, that's how desperate we were. So I, I think us walking through that season of brokenness and us having to come face to face with what does the gospel actually mean? Like, right. does Jesus truly go after broken people? I think that for us was like, okay, we can connect with these people. This is going to 
be our starting point with them. And how do you overcome that stigma though? So, you know, there's a whole stigma related to mental health and how people feel and perceive mental health and the discussions that go around mental health. How have you um, had to overcome that to even get to the point where you are today and speaking about this and talking about it and preaching about it at church? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's be becoming confident what Jesus has done in my life. So um, when I was at my absolute worst, I, I really did have an encounter with Jesus. And, and I know everybody feels so many different ways about that, but I feel like our relationship with Jesus is personal. And he met me in a crazy way. I was face down on the floor in our upstairs bedroom and I was completely suicidal. And I, I just, I cried out to God. I was like, this can't, this can't be it for me. Like I, and if this is it, then I need you to take me. Like I was literally asking God to kill me. <laughs> and if you don't do it, I'll do it for you, you know? And that's where I was. And, and I remember in that moment, hearing God's voice just speak through my pain. And, and God said to me, I love you right. even here, even now. And so I think just having that encounter with Jesus and that encounter with the gospel, and then just realizing like, you know, if to me, yeah, there's a stigma, but I look at everyone, I'm like, we're all broken. So like, you right. can you can look at me and be fearful of me or judge me or whatever, but you have just as much brokenness as I have, you know, because of the fall, we're all broken. Right. And so I think when you experience your own brokenness and when you experience the love, grace and forgiveness of the gospel in that moment, then it just becomes, we're all in the same playing field. And, and I have a message, I've gotta be faithful to use my story because God has given me my story, given me my voice, given my second chance. And really at this point, I really don't care what you think, you know? Know, like, right. You know, I, I mean, and you've got to get to that point. And you mentioned that, you know, it was all new to you and it was new to your mm -hmm. husband too. the whole um, mental health um, issues and all of that. It didn't occur to you until after you were married. You had yeah. no problems prior to that. So, you know, you're you already had your faith. You were well founded in that from your story, mm -hmm. but you had to overcome that portion of it as a married couple. And with him being a new pastor, um, yeah. you know, how did you guys find your recenter yourself back into your faith, you know, cause that's a trying time to have to go through. Yeah. No, it really is. I know I did question my faith, um, in the beginning of it, because I just thought if there is a God, like, where is he, you know, right. like I I've done everything right. You know, I didn't smoke. I didn't drink. I didn't have sex before marriage. Like I did everything right. So why am I in this mess? I didn't sin my way into, you know, how we think as believers so often, you know, like, we do. And you, you, yeah. you have that and you have that. It's kind of guilt of, you know, I'm, I'm not living up to what I'm supposed to be because exactly. I have this issue and I yes. am, you know, doing whatever, you know, hitting your husband or, you know, whatever was yeah. happening. You, you have that guilt and you have to overcome that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we, um, I was in, um, I was seeing a licensed mental health counselor twice a week. And then at the same time, we drove actually up outside of Atlanta and met with a couple there that works just with ministry couples who are going through basically a crisis of faith. And I would say those two days outside of Atlanta was where I really learned about who I was in Christ and what God did for me when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for me. And I, and I realized this is what God sees when he looks at me. He sees Jesus Christ. And I think getting my identity and who I was in Christ was um, huge. And, and I think that's really what started to turn the tables for me. It's like, okay, I know I'm always loved. I'm always accepted. I'm always worth it. I'm always secure in Jesus Christ. So as a result of my safety there, I, even though I may feel unsafe in my own mind, you know, with Jesus with me, we can start working through the trauma and all of the basically rewalk the path of trauma that had gotten me to that point right and basically rewire my brain and get me healthy and so I think it was just really learning who I was in Christ and what he had done for me on the cross and you continue to mention healthy and I love that you're mm -hmm. saying you're healthy and you're not healed um, yeah. because there's really you know we've you know there's really no coming back um, and being healed completely from mental illness it's part of you it's part of your identity and it is who you are um, you know how do you how did you finally get to that point Point where you feel like you're healthy and realize that you wouldn't be completely healed per se. 
Yeah, that's a great question. So um, for me, we were, m- my brother got married in March of 2011 and we were in Texas and we we went to um, an extension campus of Village Church, Matt Chandler's church down there. And he was preaching a message out of Second Corinthians about Paul's thorn in the flesh. And I'll never forget, I'd always heard that that was like his eyesight or maybe his speech impediment or something. But um, Matt Chandler explained it, that he really felt like it was a, a mental or emotional issue. And as I kind of started thinking through Paul's life and and verses in scripture and stuff, I don't know that you can really deny that that could potentially be it, like a mental emotional issue. And so I remember in that moment, just being so overcome with emotion, like, okay, this is my thorn, these mental illnesses, this is my thorn, and God's not going to remove them. I felt like in that moment, God really impressed on my heart. He was not going to heal me completely of these. He wanted me to get healthy so that I could be a voice and speak into people's life and say, listen, like, you know, because to me, it's so hard to listen to someone who's like, I've been healed. Here's all right. the steps because, you know, we can do all the steps and still not get healed. And so what does that mean? Does that mean God ignored us? God doesn't like us? Like, that's so dangerous. And so for me, I was like, OK, I want to be someone that's like, no, my thorn is alive and active. Um, but I've gotten to the place where I can live the abundant life Jesus has called us to. Like, it doesn't control me anymore. I control it. But it's always still there. Louis Giglio talks about it as like a cloud. It's always there. But, you know, Jesus is using it to shine his light of grace on my darkness. And you mentioned the steps you took to get healthy. There were four steps. What were the four steps that you took um, to get to that point of healthy? Okay, you're saying four steps, so I hope I... (laughs) (laughs) You mentioned, you you know, to get yourself healthy, to get yourself centered. Um, So talk about Uh, those a little bit. Okay. Um, I didn't know I had four, so now I feel put on the spot. But I know for (laughs) for sure um, it was... You've done your homework, Heather. Um, It was, you know, finding out who I was in Christ and really solidifying that. And then it was getting into counseling with a licensed mental health counselor. I I can't say that enough. Licensed mental health counselors know our brains, know our emotions, know how we're wired. And and especially if you can find one that's a believer, um, that's huge. So I I got into counseling. And then I, I, I really started walking in community. Like, we did start letting people in. I have what I call my anxiety friends. And so when I feel like I'm going down a road where I'm going to spiral, I reach out to them and um, really just kind of get them praying around me. And And I think too, just sharing your story, like starting to talk about it. And for me, you know, sharing my story, talking about it, even talking about my brother's suicide, it's helped me process it. And I think it's also helped me look back and say, look what Jesus has done, you know? And in those moments when you're discouraged, you're like, no, he's carried me this far, he'll continue to. And you mentioned your brother's suicide. Um, Mm -hmm. Were there any, did he lead on, um, you know, because you've just mentioned he had committed suicide, but did you, did he have anything he led on to? Um, You know, was this something that you guys were aware that he struggled with mental health issues? What was the story and, you know, how did that change your path? Yeah. Um, yeah, actually, he had been a children's pastor at numerous churches in Texas um, and had worked for a Christian college. And But he was hopping around from job to job to job. And, and something just didn't seem right about it. And um, in the process of all that, he had gotten diagnosed with shingles um, from what he said two different times. And that's when he first got introduced to opioids. And um, he, you know, it's so funny. Hindsight's twenty twenty. In in high school and college, he would drink NyQuil to help him sleep. I don't know why I wasn't like, oh, that's odd, you know. But you just don't think about those things. And so between the NyQuil, the opioids. Um, you could tell he was spiraling. And then there was a warrant out for his arrest about two years before he committed um, suicide. Then he, we found out he had cancer um, in his kidneys and through that had to be put all, you know, he had, he, there's a warrant out for his arrest, 21 days in rehab, got a kidney removed. And then, you know, in the process that's painful. So you're back on the morphine, you're back on, so just was a terrible spiral. So we had a really honest conversation the summer before he committed suicide. And in that conversation, he let on to a number of things that I knew he would say specifically, like, if this happens again, I will kill myself. And he was very clear. And so I remember wow. alerting a couple of people like, hey, if this happens again, he's going to kill himself. And um, I well, knew he was on, a on your journey, though, to talk to him about um, you know this and, and to kind of be aware of that it was a yeah. serious thing. Were you far enough yeah. along? I was, yeah. And I tried to talk to him as much as I could. I think part of the problem was I had dealt with a lot of my anger and a lot of 
um, my bitterness. And when I would talk to him about like, hey, I think a lot of this is a result of that. He he did not want to, his anger began to define him and identify him right. than not Jesus Christ. And so he didn't, it was like a buoy for him. He, he didn't want to let it go. He thought if he let go of his anger, he would drown. And so, I mean, I even remember in that tw- uh, October of 2018, just a couple months before he died, I preached my story at our church and I said, hey, I would love for you to listen to this. But he just wasn't in a place where I think he could get honest. And, and I think so, that's, that's a scary thing for a lot of people um, yeah. that they're in that place. And so that's why I love that you are raising and, and changing the the tone of mental health and trying to push that and create a community where people feel safe um, through your blog and your um, scary story, um, their scar story. So, you know, you're, you're, actively doing this, and I truly appreciate that. Um, you. In your blog, you write about self-medicating, and I think mm-hmm. that's how a lot of people cope with that anger, or they think that they can make themselves better and not have to um, medicate and go through uh, therapy and things like that. You mentioned that there were, and I'm going to quiz you on this again, there were three okay, C's. Um, <laughs> oh, there it is. Okay. Yes, you have three C's. So what are the three C's you have that kind of help you with um, overcoming the self-medicating that I think a lot of people with mental illness do instead of seeking help, instead of going out and doing what they're supposed to be doing. This is new. I just came up with the three C's like about a month ago. So you may have to help me. It's so embarrassing. But um, (laughs) I know that first I first I said it was church and then I changed it to Christ. You know, Christ needs to be number one. Um, And then counseling and community. Did I get them right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. <laughs> like, put me on the spot. Um, but yeah, your relationship with Christ. I mean, I know there's probably going to be people watching and listening to this that do not have a relationship with Christ. And I get asked that all the time. Well, what if you don't believe in God? And all I say is, is like, I, you know, I, I know you can still live well because there are there are counselors and professionals out there that can help you. But ultimately, my experience is that I don't know how you do it without Jesus Christ. I don't. You know, I I, I don't know how you do it without Him filling those deep needs that we all have and to help Um, you not feel alone um you know he's always with you yeah and and at the core a lot of times of mental illness is is we're so ashamed um and we're so we're so ashamed of our brokenness and, and then what the pain we've caused in other people's lives the pain we've caused in our own lives and the answer to shame is forgiveness and and i feel like we can only forgive ourselves so far where until we need someone else to be like hey i'm gonna wash my forgiveness over you and that's what christ does and so um christ is the first c and then um counseling you, you've got to get into counseling if, if you're anxiety, depression, whatever it is, is debilitating you, you're not going to get through it until you figure out what's triggering you. And then how do you fight against those triggers healthily? You know, um, I really believe that strongly. And then community, you've got to get people around you that you trust that will fight with you. And I love that story in the Old Testament where, you know, God calls the Israelites to fight against, um, you know, here we go again. I don't know what army, but one of the armies as they're trying to get the promised land. And you remember the story where God asked Moses to hold the rod over his head right? and his arms get tired. And so then Aaron's helping him. And then, and I picture in my head now, there's all these old men hold, they're like becoming like a pyramid and then they're resting their arms on rocks and stuff. But mental illness is exhausting. And you've got to have people that can come in and have faith for you and fight for you right. when you don't feel like you can. And you, they, you've you got to have people, too, that can sense it. Because sometimes when we're at the worst in our mental illness, we can't even express it. Um, and we just get so lost, we don't even have the strength right. to express it. So having those people in your corner is huge. Well, I truly appreciate you taking some time with us uh, today mm-hmm. to talk about these um, and, and all you're doing to help change the game and remove mm-hmm. some of that stigma and negativity that's out there about um, mental health. So I truly appreciate that. And I thank you for being with me. And um, I hope everybody has time to go check out your website at NicoleGoodman.org. Oh, golden, but yes. Golden, sorry, I said it wrong again. I apologize. (laughs) NicoleGolden.org. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. Took 
the breath you breathe your life in me Remember this guy, he was on American Idol, did a great job. I thought he could have won the whole thing. Honestly, but they ain't ready for Christians on American Idol. I mean, they ain't ready for it, truly, they're not. But anyway, I want to say to you, if you're dealing with mental health, you can get the help. Let me tell you what I believe. Go back to Mark chapter 5, where the demoniac, where God cast out the legion of yes. demons. Now, back then, they called it the legion of demons. Now we diagnose it as schizophrenia, ADHD, and all these other right. symptoms. That, but, but the Bible called it the demoniac. The man was full of demons. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, so much so that he would try to throw himself into the fire, he'd try to hurt himself. And I know some of you may look at some of these symptoms you deal with, but I wanted to encourage you tonight. Just like when they came to Jesus, the crowd came to you, verse 16 in Mark chapter 5, the Bible says that they saw that man, that same man who had terrorized that community for years because of his condition. Uh, he, they call him the demoniac. Yes. But the Bible said when he met Jesus, he was sitting at, at the feet of Jesus, clothed, where he was running around naked, now he was fully clothed. Then the Bible said that he was sitting there in his right mind. Mm -hmm. In his right mind. Now, they weren't concerned about this man being healed. They were concerned about Jesus casting the, swine, uh, the, the demons into the swine, and they lost all that money. Right. Because <laughs> the swine killed itself by running over the ridge and drowning itself. So they was more concerned about losing the money at the swine than the man being healed. Why did I tell the story? The world is not concerned about your condition. God is. Amen. So you seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, then all these things. Like Lorraine said, she sought the Lord. She cried, don't let that taboo hang over your house where you don't want to talk about it. Get the help you need. Matter of fact, call that number, 770-300-9828. We will put you in touch with some help that you need desperately. Also, talk to your pastor. Go to your pastor. Let your pastor share, share that intimacy with your pastor. And right. get prayer. Get prayer. Yeah. Get, get some help. So I just want to encourage you, this month we're talking about mental health. But we at WATC, we're more than just a TV station. We are a help station. We are a place of resources. Matter of fact, through this whole COVID-19 pandemic, this station had never shut down. It kept the camera rolling. We kept the business open. We kept people working in this television station because we wanted to get the gospel message out to you. So over the past 25 years, this station has been open as a beacon of hope, as a lighthouse to this Atlanta community and around the world. For those who watch it online, we here at WATC are committed to getting you the help and the resources you need. But if this station has been to help you in any way, call that number, 770-300-9828. You may have resources you want to give back. You may have finances you want to give to help support this ministry. If you've been a part of this ministry for years watching this television station, you're a Christian business owner, or you've seen God do something supernatural in your life, call that number. Sow a seed, be a blessing to this ministry so we can keep this ministry going. We love you and there's nothing you can do about it. Hey, honey, in closing remarks, you have anything you want to add? Keep Jesus is alive. Amen. He will be here to help you. But call that number, 770-300-9828. And we at WATC will always be here to answer that phone. We love you and there's nothing you can do about it. We'll see you tomorrow night. God bless you.